Hello, parents. This is Dana Kay here with another edition of the Soaring Child podcast. Now, we have many parents in our community. I think we've got our Facebook group, which has, oh gosh, something like 29,000 people. So I will just tell those listeners here, listening right now, that if you aren't in that Facebook group, you need to get into it ASAP. It's called the ADHD Parent Nutrition Support Group. But that's not what we're talking about today. We have many, many, many people in our community and we have sometimes the best questions being asked to us. And so what we do actually every month, we survey our community and we ask them, what are their burning questions for ADHD? And I thought to myself, well, why don't we have that same topic on the podcast? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. The most common burning questions we get asked about ADHD and reducing those ADHD symptoms naturally in children. Our guest is a regular on my show and she needs no introduction, but for those new listeners, I want to just do a quick introduction of her. She is a part of my amazing team at the ADHD Thrive Institute. She's a board certified holistic health practitioner and also an FDNP. And she has also worked with children who have behavioral disorders and learning disabilities for many years. She specializes in coaching families through implementing diet and nutrition changes, including helping with meal planning, creating buy-in, maximizing time in the kitchen, and so much more. She's also proficient in interpreting labs, customizing diet, lifestyle supplement protocols, and supporting all of our wonderful clients through their healing journey. She not only brings her professional expertise, but her personal experience as a mom with a kiddo who has also been on this journey. Uh, Her son used to struggle with ADHD, ODD, and emotional dysregulation. She's a mom of two gorgeous boys and enjoys spending time in her garden and making memories with her beautiful family. Now it's time to welcome Andrea Daigle to the Soaring Child. Hi, Andrea. Welcome back. Hi, Donna. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I love having you here uh, on a regular basis and we always have the best conversations. So this one's a good one, actually. Burning questions and the questions that we get asked from our community are amazing. And so uh, we're going to tackle some of those today. We've sort of collated that list of the most common ones we get asked. So we're going to dive in because we've got a few of them. Uh, So does food really matter when it comes to reducing ADHD symptoms naturally? Will it really make that big of a difference? Yes, Donna, food really does matter. And the simple truth is that food just isn't made the way that it was years ago. And most of the food available out there and most of the food that we're targeted with in advertising, it's overly processed or full of preservatives, loaded with chemicals. And who wants to be eating that? You know, before Mm -hmm. we didn't have to pay attention to labels. And now we need to, because I can tell you when we eat better, we feel better. And just from my own personal experience and things that have happened in my family, when I changed my son's diet, he was like a completely different child within a matter of two to three weeks. And we just saw things getting progressively better and better. So yes, food makes a difference and it makes a big one. I completely agree 100%. And for those that are regular listeners to the podcast, uh, they probably would have heard me say uh, diet is the foundation of our whole body. And it's like when we're building a house, if that house doesn't have a solid foundation, it's not going to be very strong and the body is exactly the same. Uh, funnily, that you, the way that you described it in food what is just not the way it used to be. Uh, we had someone come uh, into the program and was asking, how do I explain this to uh, my parents? They always say, well, you know, we used to eat this same way and we never had all of these issues, but you're exactly right. Food is not what it used to be. And also another thing, a lot of the time our parents, a lot of the time the mums didn't work. Uh, And so they had more time to be in the kitchen, prepare that fresh food. But the amount of processed food these days is just 
oh, through the roof, uh, the amount of packaged foods that we're eating. But also I want to add to that the soil that our plants are growing in. It's not what it used to be. It is sucking the plants of nutrients. And if we look at the, the nutrients, say, in uh, some broccoli back 50 years ago, it's not going to be the same nutrients that it is now all the pesticides, all those chemicals, they're breaking down the soil, our water. And so you are 100% right. For those that are out there listening, where do I start? Let's start with food. And maybe maybe another day we'll we'll do a we'll do a episode on, you know, studies to support that because there are ample studies out there supporting that diet is critical for kids with ADHD. Uh, so that was that's a, you know, a great question to start off. Um, you know, I, I think one of the biggest ones we get asked from people is about supplements. You know, the, I, I remember back in the day when 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 my son was going through this, I would read Facebook group after Facebook group and just the amount of supplements out there uh, was just so confusing. So where where do families start and how do they really know that they're getting good quality supplements? Yes, you know, the, I get that question so many times when our families are just starting out. and And the first thing I always tell our families is, we can't supplement our way out of a bad diet. So going back to what you said, diet does need to be the foundation of everything we do. And then once you cleaned up the diet and in the process of even cleaning it up, you can start bringing in some of those good quality supplements. But it's really important to know what you are buying because there are thousands and thousands of supplements out there and they're just not created equal. So mm -hmm. a lot of them, they're full of added sugars and those unnecessary ingredients. So this is another time where we really need to be paying attention to those labels. Um, best to avoid gummies. Gummies are loaded with additives and sugars. And if you don't know where to start, just visit the store at the ADHDthriveinstitute.com because you will find several different brands of good quality supplements on that site. And you can even shop the bundles listed there for a good place to start. Um, you know, things like omegas and probiotics, those are going to help support the gut and really reduce that inflammation in the body. But if you're looking to go further than that, my suggestion is really to do some functional lab testing, really dig deeper on what's going on in the body so that then you can supplement with intent and purpose because you can spend thousands of dollars trying this supplement or that one because you saw it on a website or heard about it on a podcast, but you will go so much further and you'll take your child so much further when you're really working with a qualified professional who can support you through this. 100%. I would even say 1000%. <laughs> Can you go higher than 100%? Uh, that is so true. Uh, we, you know, every kid is created, uh, not every kid is created equal. Uh, everyone is a bio individual. And so what supplement might work for one child might not necessarily work for another child. Uh, and that happened with my son as well. I might've shared this story before, but uh we had read that there was some, you know, miracle supplement that helped some family uh, back in the day. And I, I ordered it on Amazon. That's another story. Uh, I ordered it on Amazon and it because of prime, you know, prime delivery and I got it overnight and I, I was standing by the door. I couldn't wait for it to come. And it did the complete opposite. My son had major, major, major meltdowns. And I'm like, but I've read it was like the game changer and you get your hopes up every yes. single time. And so really just working with someone, but also, you know, following someone who is an expert in ADHD, you know, yes. they're going to share those strategies. They're going to share those supplements that really matter. We've done an episode on supplements in particular We'll drop that into the show notes for anyone that's um, interested for the, I think it was like the top five supplements for kids with ADHD. That's a good one to listen out for. Uh, but just on that Amazon, uh, on that Amazon topic, Andrea, do you remember uh, one of the mums in the program that ordered uh, a supplement? Normally got normally got it from from the ADHD Thrive Institute, but was desperate because she'd forgotten to order and she ordered it off Amazon. And it came and it was a completely different color. Do you yes. remember that? 
Yes, I do. Same packaging, everything. And it was a completely different color it, and couldn't verify the buyer that she bought it from. So it was just a, a disaster all the way around. Yeah, I think she rang the manufacturer and said and gave the lot number and they said, that's fake. Mm-hmm. Could you imagine? Yeah. Like, what was it? Like, what if she didn't even look at that? What would have been in the supplement? So listeners, whatever you do, do not buy supplements off Amazon. Look, Amazon is great for so many different things. I literally just got a package from Amazon today uh, with something in it for the house, but it is not a supplement store. The things that you really need to look out for are um, how is it being stored? You know, supplements aren't meant to be stored in the heat, okay? Uh, When's the use-by date? You don't want a supplement coming that's going to expire in in a couple of months. Um, is it is it coming direct from the manufacturer? Because then you know you're getting the real thing. But most most on Amazon, they're resellers. They're not the actual manufacturer. So everything that we have on our site, look, you, there are there are a number of good quality providers out there. But you want to make sure that those things are covered for sure. Uh, and that you're getting good quality ingredients and you trust whoever you're getting from. But I love that point that you said that you can't supplement out, oh, your way out of a poor diet, Andrea. I think that that's the key here. Everyone needs to get their nutrients from food first uh, and then really tailor the supplements uh, to fit that particular kid. I think I could have spent way over, I think it's like $180,000 you know, on random supplements and random things before I actually found. Yes. I spent so much on supplements. I had a very similar situation. I gave my son magnesium and I thought I was, that was the thing to do. Not even realizing, just found it on a blog that I follow and things went sideways. He was the worst he had ever been just taking that. So definitely want to work with a professional when you're doing something like that. That's funny because it was magnesium for my son too. Did I ever share that with you? No, I don't think so. Yeah, it was magnesium for my son too, but we know that not all magnesiums are created equal and there are so many different versions of magnesium that are used for different things. So you do really need to pick the right magnesium. My magnesium is amazing and it, it can be so beneficial for so many for so many kids, uh, but you need to pick the right one So uh, uh, because we don't want to get something that actually is not absorbed by the body pr- well. Right. Now... Yeah. I know when we were struggling with my son's symptoms the most, the biggest thing for me was his emotional dysregulation. And uh, because I think that's the hardest on the family. For did, sure. Was Bo, did Bo suffer from that? He did. And it was just devastating. I mean, it was at first, it was just a little bit here or there. We thought it was typical for his behavior for his or the typical behavior for his age. But as he got older, and we ended up having a big move for our family, it started getting out of control. It started happening at home every day, then carried over to school. So yes, I know all too well about that dysregulation. Yeah, it's like that emotional roller coaster. It's like, what's going to set them off? And so one of the biggest questions we get asked or the most common question we get asked is what will it take to get rid of that emotional dysregulation? Uh, And because I know when I was going through it, my family was in shambles. I know that um, uh, everyone that suffers, has their kids suffer from that emotional dysregulation. They feel like they're walking on those eggshells constantly. So what, what will it take? Yes. And and I just want to say, I'm sorry, you know, that your family's mm-hmm. been struggling with this because I know how tough it is. And uh, you question your parenting, you question, are we doing the right, going to the right doctors? Are we feeding them the right foods? You start to overanalyze and overthink what are we doing wrong? But I will just say, you're going to make it through this because I see it daily with the families in our program. And Kids are becoming more and more dysregulated. There's crying, yelling, screaming, hitting, the meltdowns. If your child is doing this, it's their body's way of telling you they're overwhelmed and they need help with something. And the first place that I would start looking at is the diet, just like we talked about. Food matters. And so let's start slow. Clean up the food dyes, you know, start looking at how much sugar you're having throughout the day. If you're drinking juice and sodas, start drinking more water and smoothies and just start taking those baby steps to living a low inflammatory lifestyle. 
And if you've already cleaned up the diet and you're still dealing with this dysregulation, then we need to go deeper and we need to look at that functional lab testing to see what is driving that dysregulation. Because oftentimes there is a heavy load on the body that's playing a part in all of this, like things like parasites or mold toxicity, bacteria, yeast overgrowth. I mean, these things are becoming more and more common in our kids and we really need to support them through this to help them feel better. Definitely, definitely. Like you think about it, um, if you've got a parasite in your stomach uh, and it's wreaking havoc, you're not going to be very happy. And as a kid, they don't know that, you know, it's something, they don't need to have stomach problems for it to be causing issues. And they don't know, they don't know what they should be doing. We, we're like, oh, we can, we can articulate, but what happens to them is they're like, they just don't feel good. They're going to melt down. That's a warning sign that something else is wrong. Uh, So we, yeah, you're right. We need to reduce that inflammation and we do that first with diet. And, you know, I think that, um, listeners would have definitely heard me talk about what those three main um, inflammatory foods are. And, you know, just for, for new people here, it's, it's gluten, dairy, and soy. And that's really uh, where we need to start taking those out of the diet. And I think that leads me to the next very commonly asked question is, do we have to be 100% gluten, dairy, and soy free for this to work? Well, the short answer is yes, you know, we do need to be 100% gluten, dairy and soy free, but I will say this is a, a process. It's incredibly hard to wake up and change a child's diet. I know this because I've lived through this. I've lived with one child who is a picky eater and one who is not. So it really needs to be a gradual process for for it to be effective and and for you to feel good about it because we don't want you to feel overwhelmed and stressed. And so definitely take your time and give yourself permission to take your time because it's not possible to flip the switch and have a completely different diet in a week, let alone a month, you know, especially with kids. And and you, you tackle on those barriers like picky eating or sensory issues. Those things can be challenging, you know, when you're the, at just the thought of making changes to the diet. So it's definitely best to take it one step at a time because every little step is going to be helpful, no matter how big or how small it is. That's so true. That's so true. I, I like to say that every every little step keeps you moving forward. Uh, yeah. So you're so true. It doesn't matter how big or how little it is. You just want to do one step at a time. And as I always say, Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, so you don't need to make all of these changes in a day either. You know, just like Andrea said, uh, we've lived it. Um, I lived it all by myself and I made every change in day one, including 40 food sensitivities that my son was sensitive to. And let me just say, that is not what I teach inside the program <laughs> because I had multiple panic attacks. Like I was literally on the floor um, one time, and this is completely too much information, but for those that have uh, listeners uh, probably realize that sometimes I don't have a filter, uh, but you know, I was so distraught with anxiety. One time I even vomited um, uh, when I was going through this and it was an awful time. So that's definitely not what I teach. I teach that you take that one step at a time. Uh, you don't need to do everything on day one. Uh, but, you know, as Andrea said, you do have to get there to 100%. Uh, you know, why is that, Andrea? You know, why families are probably listening and thinking, well, okay, that's good and well, but why? Yeah, there's several reasons why we need to get to 100% because what can happen, especially as you're eating something like gluten, our kids can react to gluten in the body for weeks, even months after mm -hmm. eating it. And so if you take it out for a week and then you're, oh, we can have the pizza on the weekend or we can have the cupcakes on the weekend, then you're never going to get off of that hamster wheel. You're mm -hmm. going to continuously be chasing the wheel or chasing, you know, chasing the hamster on that one. And the other thing is some of our kids, they are reacting to some of those proteins and peptides in the gluten, you know, gluteomorphin and prodenorphin. If they are reacting to those, they will have a gluteomorphin withdrawal response. And I know you've talked about this in your um, previous podcast, but what that means is when they eat gluten, they can have withdrawal symptoms from that, that will trigger anxiety, depression, bowel issues. And so it's even more important to 
take those baby steps to removing it and then get it out completely so that you don't have to go through those withdrawal effects over and over and over again. Yeah, you're so right there. And if they do have those peptides to gluten, the glutamorphin and the protonorphin, and so what you're doing is if you don't if you don't eat it for four days, you start going through that gluten withdrawal. Then if you eat it, you've got gluten back in your system. And then you take it out again and you start going through that gluten withdrawal. So it's like this tug of war. Uh, and you're going to constantly be going through this, this gluten withdrawal and you're and you're you're going to be thinking to yourself, oh, my kid's getting worse. He's not getting better. But you need to get past that gluten withdrawal, which can take two to three weeks. And once you're past it, I actually like kids that go through with with the withdrawal because you know that they're the ones that are going to have probably the best response. That being said, don't worry if your kid doesn't go through gluten withdrawal. You can still have an amazing, amazing response to that one. Uh, you've you've mentioned one of your one of your boys was a picky eater. And we come across this one so often. Uh, One of the questions we got in the last burning question um, when we put that out to the community was, um, my child is picky. He won't eat anything. How can I change the diet when he only eats four or five foods? Yeah, picky eating can be so tough, but just know it's extremely common. And about 70% of the families that we work with are picky eaters. So you're definitely not alone there. And I will say that things like food chaining can help with picky eating, um, but you definitely want to take things very, very slow and have realistic expectations. So if we're only eating three or four foods every single day, we're not going to wake up tomorrow and be eating broccoli and a completely gluten, dairy, soy-free diet in a day or in a week or two weeks. It's going to take some time. So you want to have those realistic expectations and you want to bring in things like food food chaining and the family food challenge and really give yourself permission to take it slow. And if you feel like you've already been trying some of these things, um, sometimes, and, and I had to come to terms with this as well, it, it, sometimes it's best to turn to the professionals and really get some help mm-hmm. and some guidance to work through that because it does not have to be a barrier from getting your kids the happiness that they deserve. Oh, you're a hundred percent right. Uh, uh, we have had so many families that you kind of get frozen. You, you, you don't know what next step to take because we have this, uh, parental instinct inside us when our children are born that we have to feed them. We have to nourish them. And so when they only eat four or five foods, you give them that four or five foods because that's our instinct, our our human nature to want to make sure that they get food. But what happens is it becomes this real vicious cycle. It's uh, it's this really bad habit that needs to be broken. And sometimes it can take some hard, tough love to break it. But you know, you need to get to a point where you're changing, you're flipping the script because at the moment this is probably the script in the house. Um, Here's dinner. Oh, I don't want it. I don't like it. Eh, Okay. I'll give you what you want. Here we go. Okay. I'm happy. But if you all of a sudden, you know, try to say here, we're having this too bad. You're not eating it. That can sometimes be quite shocking for some kids. And so you actually have to flip the script in a way that we are families that try new foods and we do that. We've got a number of strategies. Probably should, we've, we've done one episode on picky eating, but not you and I. Maybe uh, it might be a good one to do because there are many different stories we could tell and we could probably do a whole episode on it because uh, there's an, a number of different strategies out there that families can use. And I would I would use different strategies depending where you are in your journey. But I will say that it's really surprising when you actually start reducing inflammation in the body uh, through taking out these inflammatory foods, it's amazing how the palate opens up. You would never think that that's the case, but we have a team member also in our business. Um, I always use her as the example. Uh, her son was the same as that, you know, that question he he ate for four or five foods when, when he started with us and we slowly worked to change that. 
this kid now eats over 250 foods. He's not a picky eater anymore. Uh, so it is not hopeless. Uh, listeners out there, if you do have a picky eater, there's definitely things um, that you can be doing. And probably maybe, Andrea, next episode that we do together, maybe we should we should powwow on that one. Definitely. I think it'll be very helpful because I will say just like that emotional dysregulation, we're seeing more and more kids coming with that. We're also seeing some very, very picky eaters. So I think that will be super beneficial for everybody. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I will say just a, a quick tip um, for families listening that are like, well, I need something now. Uh, check to see the zinc status of your child. So there is a, a it's called a zinc assay test. You can just you that one you're, you're okay to buy on Amazon. Uh, and basically you put a you put a teaspoon of this zinc liquid in their mouth. And if they taste it immediately, they're not deficient in zinc. If they don't taste it at all, they're severely deficient. So there's a different rating scale that you can you can do to test how deficient they are. And if they're deficient, if you're deficient in zinc, it your taste buds actually m- have issues and they can't taste the food the way that it's meant to be taste and actually taste disgusting. So picky eating can actually start from zinc deficiency, but unfortunately it's now become a really bad habit as well. So we can fix the zinc deficiency, but we also need to break the bad habit. Uh, So it's a combination of that approach. Now you mentioned Andrea uh, lab testing. You mentioned that uh, you know, we can we can bring in supplements, we can bring in food. Uh, sometimes we need to go a little bit deeper, uh, or we need to tailor the supplements for that particular uh, particular child. So, what labs, you know, do you recommend? Where where? Uh, and this is a common question that gets asked: Where can I get these done for my child? Yes, definitely. So I do think uh, if you can explore things further with functional lab testing, you're really getting a clear picture of what's going on in the body and it allows you to directly target those healing opportunities. So uh, the first test I would do is through Biome Effects, I do a stool test. That is looking at the state of the gut. It's looking for things like parasites, bacteria, yeast overgrowth. Um, There's things that we want to look at to see if there is a breakdown in the gut, what contributes to content constipation and that emotional dysregulation, all of those things. So that would be the first test I would run. Uh, The second one, I think it's important to do a food sensitivity panel because even though the foods are not the problem, they are a result of that leaky gut. And when we can remove those inflammatory foods, you're allowing the body time to calm down. And so it's important to do a food panel. We use Vibrant Wellness. Uh, They will test the foods at the peptide and the protein level, which I think is great. Um, So that will be the second panel I would run. The third one is the organic acid test. This one is looking deeper in the pathways of the body. So we're looking at the detoxification pathways, mitochondrial function. It'll look at oxidative stress. It'll also show the need for specific nutrients like B vitamins, which are so important for our kids. Um, But this test will also look at yeast, mold toxicity, and we'll pick up a bacteria as well. Um, and the last test I'd run for sure is a cryptopyrrole test. So Donna, you recently did a podcast on mm. cryptopyrroles. If the listeners haven't tuned in, you definitely want to go back and listen to that one. If the pyrroles are elevated, that can create a deficiency of zinc and B6. And there are a lot of symptoms that correlate with this things like poor tolerance to stress mood swings, aggressive behavior, poor short-term memory, irritability. These are things that our kids commonly struggle with. And and I'll say about 50% of our kids have elevated pie rolls. So I would definitely start with these four labs. Um, You know, and I get this question a lot too. If I could pick one, which one should I do? I just want to say doing one without the other is like having missing pieces to your puzzle. And we're not going to get where we need to go just doing a little bit at a time. So you want to run all four. You want to have that very clear picture so that it can really drive the healing. Yeah, you're a hundred percent right there, and I'm glad you raised that because that's a really, really good point to um, just to to talk a little bit more on. Uh, you actually end up spending more money if you do them separately. 
That being said, you don't want to do more than the four because, uh, you know, when you get these four, it, it could be 10 to 12 supplements uh, along with changing in the diet. But if you add in more than that, it's too much for kids. Uh, but you end up, what happens is if you just do one, you end up, you know, bringing in supplements for that. And then that might do something else in another pathway. And so then you go down that pathway and then you start doing that. So you actually end up spending more money if you don't do them together. The other thing is, and, and, and a number of people ask, well, I just want to do a food sensitivity panel uh, because I want to know what foods they're sensitive to other than, rather than just, you know, trying to take them out and trying to guess. Uh, there's two comments to that one. Firstly, I will tell you, I have looked at so many wheat zoomers um, for like over a thousand different kids. And I can tell you that your kid is reactive to gluten. Okay. So it is causing inflammation in your kid's body. You don't need to pay $400 for a test to tell you that. Um, based on my experience, it's definitely, uh, you know, something that um, if you want to just start with diet, like that, we know, I can tell you, your kid's probably definitely sensitive. Uh, the second thing is if you just take food sensitivities out, but you don't heal the gut at the same time or know what actually caused those food sensitivities and target that, you're going to be going on this vicious cycle because yeah. you're taking the foods out, you're reducing inflammation, but you're doing nothing to close the holes in the lining of the gut that caused the food sensitivities. But also if you don't know what has caused those holes, and you're not targeting that, those holes are going to continue to grow. You're going to get more food sensitivities uh, and you're going to get more leaky gut. It's this vicious cycle that you're going to be on and you'll end up spending more money. So uh, definitely these four are a good base. There's so many more out there that, you know, we can use as, as a like a next step if required. But I'll tell you, you know, it's probably only 20 to 30% of the kids that may need to go deeper than that. Uh, majority of them, those four base tests are, are fantastic uh, to, uh, to really start with. So where, where would um, someone go to get, to get labs like that? Yes. So if you want to have these labs done, you can come to us. We are happy to help you with that. Uh, you want to find a practitioner. If you do find a practitioner, you want to find someone who works specifically with kids, because that's another thing I'm seeing. So many families are finding people locally who will run a lab and say, try these supplements, take this. And then the kids are coming to us and they're worse off because now they can't tolerate those supplements or they had missing pieces to their puzzle. They've spent thousands of dollars already with the wrong person. So you definitely want to make sure that you find someone who specifically works with kids who have ADHD. Correct. Definitely. I, I agree. Because, you know, just going to a general practitioner as well, they're not used to seeing all the patterns. Like I can, someone can give me a kid's symptoms and I can go, I bet you this is what we're going to see on all of those labs. And that's what we see because that is all we do. Uh, if, a, if a kid came to me and had, um, I don't know, I'm going to pick some random like I know, autoimmune condition, hypothyroidism. I'll be like, no, I'm not your best person. Um, don't, you know, I don't waste your money with me. I deal with kids with ADHD. I know that what I do works for them. I know what patterns to look for. A lot of other practitioners, like for the organic acid test, for example, they will literally just go, this marker is out of range. You need to take this supplement. But that's not how it works with the organic acid test. It's all about patterns. It's all about the correlation. And so one out of range marker doesn't mean you need to do anything. And so we're, a lot of people are quick to jump and add supplements for, for an out of range marker, but it really is that whole picture. So, you know, we don't want people to waste, waste time or waste money. We've been down that journey ourselves. Um, it's not fun, uh, but um, just for for, for people listening, unfortunately, most functional lab tests are not covered by insurance, uh, which is really kills me. Uh, I just wish it was. There would be so many people that would be able to go down this path so much more. Um, but we know that the pharmaceutical companies drive the medical industry here and the insurance companies. And so they don't want, they want people on medication really at the end of the day, uh, because otherwise they're not going to make any money. So these will actually avoid the need for medication in, in a lot of cases. And so why would they want to be covering those? 
Uh, and unfortunately, your traditional doctor probably won't be doing them again for the same reason. Um, you know, the pharmaceutical companies are writing the medical school textbooks. Uh, doctors aren't specialists in nutrition. They aren't specialists in this. They're only required to do one hour of um, nutrition training uh, in their whole degree. So most of them aren't, uh, and that's that's totally understandable. They're there for a purpose. They're there to treat disease. They're there to, you know, get you out of that, that chronic situation. Medication has its time and place. I'm not totally against it. Uh, and I'm going on a tangent again. Oh, so- <laughs> Sorry about that, listeners. I uh, tend to go on these tangents a little bit. Uh, Andrea, do you have anything to add to that? <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, I actually had a practitioner before I came and worked in your program and went through this journey. And my practitioner did exactly that, ordered a gut test and ordered an oats. And then I had an appointment. She said, okay, this is out of range. Take these supplements. Let me know how you go came home and trusted the process, gave him some supplements and boy, was he wild and completely having detox symptoms that I could not control. I had no idea what to do. So I went to my doctor because I had no idea what to do. And my doctor looked at the labs and said, I I don't even know what these labs are. I can't, can't help you with this, but are you ready to try medication? And that was when I was like, this is not working. I need someone who is a specialist who specializes in kids with ADHD. And that's when I found you. And here we are now. And so you are now and you are amazing. Um, so look, I think we've covered a lot in today's episode. We've probably gone a little bit over, but that's okay. I'm sure uh, listeners are getting a lot out of it. Uh, I, I actually like doing these burning questions. Uh, and so I definitely think that we should be doing another burning questions. Uh, now guys, for those listening, uh, we love to get this this podcast out to as many people as possible. So if you can just go like the podcast or follow the podcast, uh, maybe write a review, it would really, really help uh, get the word out there to families that are struggling because for us, both Andrea and I, Andrea, I'm going to speak for you now. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but I know we've had many, many a conversation. We have been in the thick of it. And it is not a fun place to be in. And every time I bring it up, I I get tears in my eyes for the thought of like where we were in life um, with my family and how unhappy we were. And I want as many families that are struggling out there to know that you don't need to suffer. This does not have to be your life. ADHD does not need to dictate the mood in your house. And so by liking and reviewing the podcast and sharing the podcast, we're getting that message out there. I know that I can't help everyone. And the podcast is like my labor of love to be able to help families that I won't be able to help as well. So I would really be grateful if you could, you know, share a review or share the podcast with someone that you think might be struggling. Any last comments, Andrea? So, you know, I hopefully uh, the fact that I spoke for you, um, I actually said something that uh, you actually agree with as well. (laughs) Yes, no, I agree wholeheartedly with what you said. And just knowing that things can change and this doesn't have to be your life. You know, I thought it was mine and I started fast forwarding and envisioning my son at 16 and just worried about what his life would be like. And I realized I'm in the now I need to do something about this now so that I don't need to worry about this. And so, you know, we're excited to be helping kids and that's what we're here for. And, um, you know, love the work that we do. Yeah, we sure do. Well, thank you so much, Andrea, for joining us today and having this conversation. I just, I just love it, uh, and and sharing your knowledge and your experience, not only, um, you know, your your professional experience, but also your personal experience with all of our listeners. Um, I really appreciate uh, you and you are coming on today to share your knowledge. Yes, thank you for having me. Fantastic. Now, listeners. Thank you for tuning into this week's episode of The Soaring Child. I'm Dana Kay, your ADHD health practitioner. Keep on thriving.